Good morning. Thank you for joining us in this study of the book of Acts. My name is L.R. Kennan, and I'm so grateful you're here with us this morning. Please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 3, and here in a moment we will get started after a word of prayer. Please pray with me. Almighty Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, for your food, clothing, and shelter, and the many blessings you have put upon us. Uh, Lord, we, there's so many blessings we can't begin to give count. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ who died upon the cross uh, so we may have eternal life. We pray, Heavenly Father, for the sick. We pray, uh, Heavenly Father, for an end to this virus which plagues our country and this world. And we pray, Heavenly Father, the, through this, the word of God is taken to others and that others obey your word. And we pray, Heavenly Father, you bless West End, uh, help West End to grow and help us to spread the word of God. We ask for your forgiveness of sins. In the name of Christ, our Lord Jesus, we pray, amen. All right, it's so good to have you with us today. Please turn to Acts chapter three, and we will cover this chapter uh, this morning. Uh, give me a second to share my screen with you and get that uh, pulled up. Here we go. And so there. So Acts chapter three is Peter and John at the temple. And so we're gonna look at that this morning, Peter and John at the temple. And it's, it starts out really interesting uh, in this. So we see that Peter and John went uh, up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So how much time has passed since Pentecost? We really don't know. Uh, no hint is given. Uh, Jerusalem in a city of 50,000 or so people, uh, even though thousands came to Pentecost, there's a conversion of 3,000 people to Christianity. And this growing is bound to be getting some attention, uh, maybe the wrong attention. The miracle uh, we see in this chapter is notable within itself, but it's recorded chiefly because of its effect. The miracle is selected among many miracles the apostles wrought uh, because it brought them into conflict with authorities too later in chapter four. Uh, so we'll see opposition and persecution will start in chapter four. Uh, even though those first days we may suppose that the evangelistic work of the apostles was mostly unopposed, uh, we'll see that John, uh, Peter and John's working of the miracle uh, through um, the hand of God uh, to heal the lame man ignites opposition and persecution uh, from the authorities. So we see here that Peter and John, they went to the temple of the hour of the prayer, uh, ninth hour. Now their sacrifices made twice a day at the temple uh, on Judaism, okay? And they typically pray for uh, at three times a day. Now we often see Peter and John associated together. They evidently been friends from the youth upward. They've been fishermen, uh, partners on the Sea of Galilee before Jesus called them. And a close friendship unites them. By nature, they're different too. Peter's impetuous, John is serene. Uh, they fit, diamond polishes diamond, so to speak. Um, some speculate in John 1 41, where Andrew uh, tells Peter we found the Messiah, that this is proof that they're familiar with John the Baptist teachings and therefore that uh, uh, they have been baptized by John. We find James and John associated with Peter in the inner circles of the disciples at the transfiguration. Um, we uh, see at the uh, rising of Jairus' daughter and the agony at the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, they've been sent to prepare Passover meal uh, the night uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. So it was Peter and John that ran to see the empty tomb on resurrection morning. Um, these two were in a group fishing together after the resurrection. So we see these two, they're very close, very close. Um, so they're going to the temple to pray. And again, Jews counted time beginning at sunrise. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. by our measure. Their sacrifice is made twice a day in the morning and the evening. So uh, we see uh, this is a time of prayer. Uh, Psalms 55, 17, evening and morning at noon, I will pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. So that is certainly uh, within tradition of Judaism. So there we go. And a certain man uh, lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered into the temple. 
So this person uh, was lame uh, for about 40 years. We see in Acts 4.22, the man was 40 years old on, on whom this healing was laid, okay? He'd been lame in his ankles and in his feet. Um, there was no mental psych psychosomatic illness. Uh, this was a visible element, and witnesses would saw this, saw this in this man as he was begging day by day. It was normal practice for friends of a handicapped person to put that person in a place of a high traffic area. Uh, so uh, where they could beg for donations. There was no food stamps, no government assistance back then. People were more liberal when going to worship and uh, the unfortunate with the friends took advantage of the situation, helped them make a living. So this gate beautiful, which was from the court of the Gentiles into uh, the court for the women, had been a high traffic area coming and going. And so the friends are doing this man a favor. It was a custom also to put them by the gates of the rich or by the side of the highway where they may pass so they could get alms. And remember, these people going to worship, coming out of worship, their hearts would have been uh, maybe softer, more um, uh, turned toward giving in that sense. Uh, the beautiful gate was called uh, such because, because of its magnificent folding doors. And these doors were 50 feet high and 40 feet wide, uh, covered with gold and Corinthian brass. Uh, it was a favorite way into the temple. So we see this. Uh, so this man is at this gate, and he's asking for alms. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave him his, his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Now, we don't know if Peter and John had seen this man at the temple many times, and this man may have even seen Jesus when he had been at the temple. But he's asking for alms from them as he did everyone else. And fasting or fixing his eyes um, on him, uh, this means look steadfastly. But Peter and John uh, look at the lame man, and they're like, what do you expect, you know? Uh, what do you expect from us? And uh, the man's expecting alms. That's what he's expecting. He doesn't expect what's about to happen. He has no idea in this. So in verse 6, uh, Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have uh, I give you. Let me move that over there. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So we see that... Um, in Acts 2, 45, that Christians sold their possessions to divide the money among Christians who had need. So what do Peter's uh, words mean here? It may mean the common fund that Peter had, had was not available for cases of charity for unbelievers, or it may be that Peter himself did not have money to support the man in his present condition. But what he does have is this incredible blessing of God, which is far more valuable. You know, the gospel does not offer to do everything for the man, which some people think it should, or that they desire to do. The gospel is about the power of salvation from Romans 1.16, right? The gospel does not propose revolutionary social change. It proposes spiritual change, and through that, we have behavioral change in people, okay? So we see that. So this man is receiving an essential service at this point in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, all right? So we see this, and Peter immediately gives uh, the source of his power to do this miracle. It's through Jesus Christ. We see that. And so um, the beggar is commanded to do something he's never been told to do before. He's never been told, hey, get up and walk, get up and do this, right? But Peter's language is firm, and it carries assurance, all right? So in verse 7, he says, uh, he took him by the right hand, this is Peter, and lifted him up, and immediately his uh, feet and ankle bones received strength. Now, to encourage the man to rise immediately, Peter extends his hand. You know, he didn't just say, hey, rise up and walk, because the man may have just said, hey, you know. Uh, Peter is showing he's serious about this. And the uh, New American Standard Translation says, seizing him to show like a forceful movement, you know, because it says that Peter uh, grabbed him by the right hand and lifted him up, all right? So Peter's showing faith here. This man doesn't have faith yet, but Peter does. And so the same word um, here in talking about this forceful action is also used in catching fish to overcome the resistance of the fish, okay? 
So instantaneously, this man's ankles and feet and bones are healed. This is supernatural. In order to perform a miracle uh, to serve as a sign to unbelievers, it had to be obvious to all witnesses this is a result of a supernatural power. Healing that gradually occurred over a uh, period of time would not do this. Although healing over a period of time is a, is a thing to glorify God, certainly, but it's not something that's going to give proof of, of what Peter and John are doing in this particular case. All right. So he receives the strength, okay? And so when he took him up, he's leaping up and he stood and entered the temple with them, uh, walking, leaping, and praising God. So we see the, vali uh, the validity of this miracle is not dependent on this man's faith, all right? So the question is, is this crippled man spiritually saved at this point, at the point of being healed? The answer is no. He's physically healed, but he's not spiritually saved. How do we know this? Because he hasn't obeyed the gospel, okay? Are healed people automatically saved in the Bible? The answer is no, okay? They still have to obey the gospel. Remember, the point of miracles in the New Testament here that we see is give credibility to the message. So we see that, okay? So toggle down here so while I'm reading. All right, and so we see here that leaping up, he stood and walked and entered the temple with them. He's still with Peter and John, and he's walking and leaping, and he's praising God in this. He's giving glory to God. He had never seen anything like this. Uh, we see this. Um, this is a, a, a work of miracles that gives glory to God. Peter's not taking credit for it. John's not taking credit for it. So we see this gives credibility, this message that Peter and John are about to give to these people. They see, they've known this man has been crippled for a very long time. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew it was he who sat begging alms uh, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. These people are amazed. This was the hour of prayer in the afternoon. Many a people had assembled here and they were coming to the temple for worship. He got attention from his actions from walking and praising God. They, this guy, it normally sit here and begged, right? Then all the people knew that it was a lame man who sat on a daily basis in front of the beautiful gate begging for alms. There was abundance of witnesses to testify that he'd been healed, and they could not honestly deny the miracle. It cannot be denied. You know, we had the um, solar eclipse here a few years ago. Millions of people seen it. No one could deny that happened, right? I seen it myself. Beautiful thing. Can't deny that. Think about this. All these people here at the temple seeing this, they cannot deny this fact, okay? So the word wonder here is a word that denotes shock. These people are shocked to see this man who for many years was a cripple now walking and leaping around the temple. It's not normal behavior at the temple. No, I said, it's not. this is not normal behavior at the temple, okay? Amazement denotes astonishment. Uh, this arises when something never before seen is now evident and actual and undeniable. And this is disruptive to the afternoon prayer. So this clearly shows the apostles were given by the Holy Spirit the power to heal. And the man who was healed did not praise the apostles, but he praises God. And this is uh, credibility that Peter's going to need here in a minute. It's source credibility, okay? This is source credibility for this. He gave God the praise for his being able to walk. So uh, now as a lame man who was healed, held on to Peter and John, he's staying with these people. He's, he's like, I'm staying with you guys. You guys got me healed. Uh, ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's Greatly Amazed. Uh, so they're greatly amazed. They're astonished. Like I said, this is just a, a mind-blowing thing. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though through our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The wonderful thing about this, that I, one of my favorite points of this chapter, is Peter and John are giving credit to where credit's due, and that's to God. And I love that fact in here. This, this man has an attachment to him, but it's ultimately about God. And that's what's important here, okay? So we see that. Uh, this miracle was done, was the work of God to glorify Jesus. 
when we see that, and that's a, a whole purpose of this. All right, now Peter starts making his speech. He says, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate whom, when he was determined to let him go. All right, so this miracle, Peter directed to honor the miracle away from himself and away from John towards God. And the chief points of the emphasis in the message are the miracle was a work of God to glorify Jesus. The Jews had denied Jesus from ignorance. Jesus fulfilled all the Old Testament prophecies, and these people would have known about some of these prophecies, right? Therefore, they should repent and obey the gospel, all right? So that's where Peter's going with this. This is his plan of action, okay? So Peter is making his first point here. The miracle is a work of God to glorify Jesus. This is the same God of the patriarchs that they had known and worshiped. It was important to show this consistency and to show reverence in their hearts, and this is a great way to start their sermon anyway, because you're talking to a Jewish audience. These people have been proud of that heritage. So the apostles are not introducing any new religion or idolatry or anything like that. God is the faithful God, God that led them out of Egypt, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of their fathers. He gets right to the point, and he says that it is he that glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Now, the important thing we see here also is Peter is making uh, an accusation, and he, he has the right to. So he's making an accusation here. These are the same people res uh, responsible for crying out, crucify him, crucify him. Some of those same people, okay? So we see that. So as Peter did in Acts 2.23, he acknowledges who Jesus is, places responsibility of them, of their sin, of denying him square at their feet so that he, they can repent, okay? He's making the elements possible for them to repent. So he's doing this. And he says, you killed this prince of life, this one that God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Many people had seen Jesus raised from the dead. This is nothing new. Uh, a lot, I think a lot of times uh, some of these people, like the Sadducees, Pharisees, they thought when Jesus was hung on the cross, that's the end of these miracles. That's, this thing said and done. We got rid of this, and people will go on. And here we see the power of Christ through this preaching with the Holy Spirit. These apostles are doing it. They're giving credit to Jesus Christ. And they're going to have to come to a point, guess what? This is what it is. And we can't deny it. Okay? So uh, they put to death the giver of both the physical and spiritual life. They murdered the author of their own lives. Here the Prince of Life is a remarkable title given to our Lord to bring out the contrast between Barabbas, the murderer, and the Christ they rejected. Jesus, the author of life, uh, to save men's lives. Think about this in Peter's earlier statement, God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus and, and Jesus' prayer. Okay? And so we see that. That went a little too, too far. All right. My apologies. Hit the wrong button on the mouse there. All right, so we see other references to Jesus giving life and salvation. In Hebrews 2.10, it was for fitting for him for whom all are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through their sufferings. So we see uh, the resurrection of Jesus is what makes Christianity unique among the religions of the world. And in fact, it is the only true religion. So he says, whom you delivered up in the presence of Pilate. What Peter's saying to the Jews, God glorified Jesus. He delivered him up. Pilate, wa <clears throat> Pilate wanted to release Jesus, right? But you denied him. Jesus was holy and just. You preferred a murderer. Jesus was author of life, and you killed him. You betrayed him, but God glorified him. You are opposed to life because you killed the author of life. And he says, we're witnesses of this. Remember in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, for I delivered you uh, first all that which I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas and then by the 12. And then uh, after that, he was seen by 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. And after that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. And last of all, he was seen also uh, as by one born out of due time. 
So we see uh, some evidence there from Paul himself. All right, this verse I got from Numbers uh, 32, 23, when Moses is talking to Reuben and Gad about their land, but he makes a point that applies here too. And be sure your sin will find you out. And this is an important thing here. Peter's pointed out that their sin has found them out. The sin of denying Jesus and approving of him being crucified. He's putting this at their feet, okay? They see this miracle. It's accredited to Jesus. They can't deny what's happened, and they're guilty of it, all right? But the beautiful thing is there's faith in his name. There's faith in the name of Jesus Christ, and Peter wants to bring, again, another point to glorify God. And he says in verse 16, in his name, through faith in his name, he has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Faith in Jesus' name. Jesus' name is authority. It's made this lame man strong. All right? It's not faith of this lame man. He didn't have faith in Jesus. He believed in God, but he was not uh, knowledgeable about Jesus in, in the sense of having faith. Peter and John had faith in Jesus. And they display this by this action, okay? So you can inspect this lame man and see physical evidence for the spiritual Christ for yourselves in his name through faith in his name denotes naturally is through Christ Jesus that his faith brings this man in contact with God. The faith that made this man strong came from Christ, not from the lame beggar, right? So we see this. And the faith of Peter and John, which had come through Jesus and has provided abundant evidence, had resulted in the man's healing. It was obvious. It can't be denied. Not a mere improvement in his condition, but a complete instantaneous healing right there in front of him. Not only was he healed, but the man knew how to walk. It takes a baby months and months to learn to walk, right? Because they have to develop their legs and all this. Bing, this guy, he's healed. He knows how to walk, knows how to leap knows how to run, all right? Peter also says to him, he gives him some grace here. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did this in ignorance, or did it in ignorance, excuse me, as uh, did also your rulers, but those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. All right, so what Peter said is indispensable. He's, he, although he correctly accused them of being guilty of high murder of the Son of God, of which they're guilty, he says, the Jews should have known that Jesus was Messiah. They should have known this, but the fact remains they were ignorant of his divinity. The ignorance did not justify their crime nor excuse them, but it was a calling uh, for, on, on them to repent. Yet, Peter shows tenderness. He's not browbeating them into submission. He refers to them that, you know, as a brother Jew, he calls them brethren, and the fact Jesus showed compassion at the cross and we are to show compassion. And of course, the apostles had to show compassion, right? So their acts uh, were out of ignorance. And with skill and tenderness, Peter's accused him with a sharp rebuke, now binds up the wound. It's a beautiful thing to see this, all right? So the apostles showed the Jews the greatness of the crime, but would not anger or drive them to despair. Uh, surely those who reject or refuse to deny Christ uh, do it through ignorance, but in this case, there can be no excuse. They have the data they need. He's preaching to them, right? So we see that he's delivering this message to them. All right. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of his prophets that Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. Again, he's going back to the Old Testament scripture. He's showing them that the prophets foretold, uh, foreshadowed, uh, the Christ, the prophets pointed the people to the Messiah. Even the crucifixion was foretold. Jesus often told his apostles he would die for the sins of the world. Uh, their crime through real was carrying out God's purpose. This crime and crucifying Jesus did not prevent the fulfillment of what God foretold. Uh, in fact, the crime was foretold. In Luke uh, 24, 40, 44, uh, then he said to him, these are the words which I spoke to you which I, when I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. So we see, um, I also want to uh, direct you to Psalms uh, 22. I wish we could read it right now. It's a beautiful chapter, but that's a really good chapter if you would like to go to that in your own time as well. So we see that. Um, so we see that, uh, <clears throat> that these things are all through the Old Testament. Um, 
Hosea 6, 1, come and let us return to the Lord for he is torn, but he will heal us. He is stricken, but he will bind us up. Jesus is about healing, okay? And spiritual healing. So, and that's a, a point that Peter's kind of coming to there. Repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out, that these times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Peter, as in Acts chapter 2, he makes no mention of faith because these people uh, going to the temple are God believers. And Peter's laid out there the evidence of Jesus. And he's going to do so more again here in just a moment. So he's doing that. The scriptural impact of repentance relies upon a truthful sorrow, which brings men to repentance. And that's where Peter's going with this. All right, 2 Corinthians 7, 10, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So spiritual sorrow uh, leads us to life, all right? The absolute necessity of repentance is to be solemnly charged upon the consistencies of all who desire their sins may be blotted out, all right? In Acts 2, 38, we see repent and be baptized, right? Those people were at that point of repentance. They believed and they were repenting, all right? So the next step was to be baptized. These people here, he's trying to lead them to repent and then be converted. And the thing is, if they are converted, then they are going to obey and be baptized. But Peter's got to take them to that next step, whereas the people in chapter two had already arrived there, okay? So he, that's what he's doing. And so baptism is an active thing. And that's one thing I want to point out. Peter's words constitute a command here. They would understand the command to convert, uh, to change would mean they need to be baptized. For being baptized is a key active thing in turning to God. It's an active thing, not passive, as many Calvinists suggest. It is active for the remission of sins. And we see that. But these people, I got to repent first. And they hadn't done that. In Acts chapter 2 and 37, they had repented. And they're ready for that next step of baptism. So we see that. So that your sins may be blotted out. All right, this is conditional. That you meet the conditions for your sins to be blotted out. You can meet these conditions for obedience. So that the times of refreshing uh, may come from the presence of the Lord. L seasons of refreshing literally comes from the Greek uh, word anapuxis. And I know I'm mispronouncing that, and I do apologize. But that means to cool again, to refresh, or cooling, reviving with fresh air. The season of refreshing depends on the repentance and turning again and having their sins erased. And this would happen in baptism, all right? Isaiah 28, 12, uh, to whom he said, this rest is uh, with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is refreshing, yet they would not hear. And remember, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon uh, you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Refreshing, knowing that Christ is there to take our burdens, and he did take them to the cross. When sinners are convinced of their sins, they will cry out to the Lord for pardon. Okay, and to the penitent, and converted and believing, times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and and this time when they obey the gospel and they're baptized for remission of sins. Okay, and that He may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before. Of course, He's talking about a second coming coming, and there's another reason for people to repent and turn. There's going to come a point in time you're going to die, and you're going to be before Jesus, or He's going to return if you're living. That we didn't know. We don't know now. They didn't know then. Uh, so people um, are converted, uh, have converted conditions are favorable uh, for the coming of Christ. We're looking for that time. If you're a Christian, you're looking for that time. When is it going to happen? You know that God's going to take us home. Christ came uh, the first time to redeem the world. The second coming will be to complete that redemption, to take the judge, uh, the world, and to take his people home. So this is a continuation of that thought from verse 19, expressing the results of repenting and converting. The repenting and converting so their sins be blotted out, not only result in a times of refreshing and revival, but sending God's uh, uh, son to reward them eternally. So that's a wonderful thing we see here. Um, so when they, in Acts 2.37, like I said, when they heard this, they showed they showed the repentance and uh, uh and at, took an action. Here, they haven't shown their, that. Here, Peter and John are calling upon them to repent. 
All right, in verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God will raise you up a prophet like me from your brethren. All right, now, Peter going in and he's calling on them to repent. He's tying in us about Jesus again. He's tying all this in and he wants them to see this is not a new religion. This is something, I can, this is something from God and it's been established in Old Testament scripture. And he ties it into Moses. Moses is their favorite prophet. Uh, out of pretended zeal whom they uh, went after and they rejected uh, Christ. They wanted to uh, reject Christianity to destroy it. But Christ came in the world to bring a blessing. And so we see Moses foretold this. And he says, in uh, him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many who have spoken, have foretold these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So we see that Moses foretold this. Uh, we see this in, from Deuteronomy 18, 15. You know, the Jewish people come to expect a prophet to come, but they misunderstood this. And so, uh, these people did not believe that he would come to be condemned. They didn't, they weren't paying attention to this, but they, they didn't pay attention. Uh, Matthew 8, 12, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast in outer darkness. People have to obey the gospel. And Peter's trying to emphasize this, that there has to be obedience to what Jesus says. Jesus is that prophet. You must obey him. And he's that prophet in him. You will hear all things. So we see that. Um, and this is part of the promise from Genesis 22, 18. And your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you've obeyed my voice. So not did it only Moses uh, prophesy about the Christ, uh, but generally speaking, all prophets from Samuel prophesied uh, about these days, the time of Christ and his work, saying the burden of the prophets was the same as the prediction by Moses, give heed to this Messiah or perish. Under the Jews, the promises of the gospel had first been granted. We see that from Romans 1.16, the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So the conclusion of the matter is salvation will come to them through their faith in Jesus and from their turning of sin and obeying the gospel. Peter gave them the evidence uh, through the lame man being healed that the power of Jesus whom the, whom the father had raised from the dead. So we see that. And so this we conclude uh, chapter three. And on Wednesday night, we'll uh, break open chapter four. I want to thank you all for being with uh, uh, me today in the study. And I hope you have a most pleasant day.